Who do you believe? It's, it's hard more and more, isn't it? Uh, you, you turn on one news station and you get one side of a story, you turn on another channel and they'll tell you the other side of the story. You're like, well, who's right here? You can't even trust your phone anymore. You get a, you get a, a call, looks like a legitimate local number, and it turns out it's from somebody in a whole other country. Who do you believe? People, people going online and saying their chili is the best. <laughs> Who do you believe these days? Not you. I mean, which next week, don't forget, next week, bring some chili. We won't judge it if you don't want us to. We'll just eat it. When it comes to truth, who do, we, who do we trust? I think Jesus is worth taking a look at. If you, if you have any respect for him at all, even just, just as a great teacher, it's worth looking and seeing what does he say? And so what did Jesus believe about certain things? We looked at what Jesus believed about God, what Jesus believed about humanity, and this morning we want to look at what Jesus believed about the kingdom. The kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, interchangeable phrases. But what did Jesus believe about that? Let's start in Luke chapter 4. Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. The kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, like I said, interchangeable phrases is the reason that he came. To, to proclaim it, not only to talk about it, but to usher it in. To make it a present reality for us. Which, which leads us to this in Mark 9, 1. He said, Jesus again says, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. Now here's one of the things. We, we often think that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is about heaven someday. What Jesus is telling us is the kingdom of God was ushered in as a present reality with his coming. The kingdom of God is now a present reality. And where is it? When we think of a kingdom, you know, we, we think of a geographic area. And we don't even so much use kingdom that much anymore, but we get the idea it is a place where there is a certain culture, a certain language, social norms, rule of law, and an authority. Jesus is the authority in this kingdom. And he, he introduces us a new language, the language of truth and love and grace. He brings to us new norms of fidelity, of love for our neighbors and for our enemies. He brings all this into being with his coming so that it's still happening now. And what you and I are invited to do is to accept the reality of that kingdom and live within the reality of that kingdom, residing not in a particular land, but residing within our hearts. The kingdom of God present within each one of us as we choose whether or not to make it a reality for us or whether we will reject it. And so the kingdom of God is happening now. And if you can understand it and, and get that and move, move away this idea that the kingdom of God is coming someday, but rather it is here now and people are choosing to either enter it or to ignore it. I help you as you read through scripture and see some of the things that Jesus is talking about. In Luke 17, it says that once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's there now. So how do we enter into this kingdom? Early on, in Mark 1.15, we read, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent.
repent. Something has to happen here. And what we're told here is that entering the kingdom of God requires for us a change in priorities. When when all of us grow up, as we're as we're becoming more self-aware, becoming aware of the larger world, we we begin to kind of set some goals and priorities in life. We may not even be aware that we're doing it, but we're all doing it. We're we're all determining how, how how do I succeed in this world? However we define success. Some people de- determine in their, their mind, you know, here's the key to success in this world. It's however much money is in my checking account. And so the more money I have there, the more successful it is. That's what the world is about. It's about, it's about winning that. Other people say, you know what, I, I, I've got a trophy case. And the more trophies I got in that case, that's, that's it. That's That's succeeding. Other, other people will say, you know, experiences. The more places I can go and the things that I can do, that's, that's success there, right there. Or some people look at their family and say, you know, I want to have a large family or I want to make sure my family uh, accomplishes certain things. And so we, we invest there. We say that's, that's success. That's life. That's priority. And Jesus said, No. You need to come up with a new definition of success. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We need to recognize that you can't can't just stick a toe into the kingdom and fully experience it. If, if, you, if you did that, if you went to a swimming pool or a lake or the beach and you just, you just stuck your toe in and then later someone just go swimming, would you say, yes, I did? No, oh, no, I, I stuck my toe in. And, and many times this is what we do. We, we just give just a little bit of ourselves and then we can't figure out why this kingdom of God stuff just doesn't seem relevant and real to us. There was a, a young man who came up to Jesus one day and asked, said, what must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus would go on to say, well, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Now, there are a lot of commandments in the Old Testament law. We, we often think of the 10, but there are like over 600 Levitical laws. And so he, he asks kind of an interesting question, which ones? Because there's a lot. And Jesus summarizes, you, you know, you should not murder, not commit adultery, not steal, should not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, okay. And he said, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Jesus said, do this. Something's missing. I've I've done that, and I still feel like I'm not there. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, and that word can often be translated as complete or mature. Go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now Jesus said, okay, here, all right, you, you, want, you want a path? Here's a path. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad. Why? We're told here, why? Because he had great wealth. If he'd only had, you know, a dollar in his pocket, (laughs) what is this? Here you go. You can have it. I'm following you. But he had a lot. And that had taken a hold of his heart. And he couldn't release it. 
And so Jesus said, if you really want to know the kingdom, if you really want to enter the kingdom, you've got to change up your priorities. Jesus said, go on to say to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now here's something, folks. I know some of you are going to like, I'm not rich. I'm not worried about this. Ask yourself this. What do you fear losing? What do you fear losing? That'll give you a hint of what has become a God in your life. Is it your reputation? Is it your family? Your position at work? What is it you fear? That if, boy, if I lost that, I don't know what I would do in this life. That's the thing that's taken hold of your heart. That's where you and that rich young man are alike. It's got you. And you really won't know and understand the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Jesus said, until you're willing to release it. To any one of us, he may have said, go and get rid of that thing that's in your heart. That fear, that thing that's holding you. So ask yourself that. And then remember this. Jesus said when he's talking about the kingdom, he said, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. This is all about the priority. You can't, you can't live halfway in this kingdom business. You can't bring in the old stuff and expect the new to work with it. We have to be willing to throw ourselves completely on the mercy of God. Jesus tells us a little bit more in Mark 10. We read that people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. Now, who doesn't love kids? Apparently, these disciples. They're like, no, Jesus is too important for that. He doesn't have time for these kids. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. The kingdom of God, we see over and over with Jesus, is for the least of these. Jesus is quoted as saying, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. There's a parable that Jesus tells about a father who asks his two sons to do something, and one says, yeah, dad, I'll get right on it. And then he does it. The other one says, I'm not doing that. But then he changes his mind, and he does And then he asked, which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. The one who said no, that was the first one. I told the story backwards, but that's the one who told, who said no, but then he wound up doing it. And he says, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the least of these, the ones who said No, I'm going to do things my way, but then have come around and said, no, my way's not working. Something has to happen within our hearts, a humility that must take place, an emptying of ourselves to see that we are not bringing anything to the table 
that we have to come like children, completely dependent, completely dependent on the Father. It gets back to this thing, what, what is holding you? What has become a God in your life? What is that thing that makes you feel like you're not the least of these things, the least of these people? That's what you have to lose to move forward. Here's something else we see. I told them another parable. I said, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Yeast is an interesting little thing. It doesn't take much. Take just a little bit, put it in there, and it just works its way. Something's happening. And what this tells us is that the kingdom is dynamic. It is dynamic. It starts small, but then it grows. Jesus echoes this when he says, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden, and it grew and it became a tree, and birds perched in its branches. It starts as something small. You think about this, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, you know, it comes down to this little place on the edge of the Mediterranean. A country that, that is really, a, people just keep, they want it, it's fought over, because it's mainly like a, a place where you can get to from one place to another. It's a crossroads. That was it. It wasn't a rich country. Yet it started there. And it wound up taking over an empire. And then moving on from there. The church, folks, you, you may not recognize this, is, is growing in places like Africa, South America, Asia. Places that started small, sometimes often even persecuted. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. And it does the same thing in our hearts. It starts out small. But it will take over your life. If you'll let it. If you'll get rid of that stuff that wants to kind of hem it in. You know, you can, you plant something in a planter and you, something can get root bound. Right? Where it wants to grow out, but it just can't anymore because it's contained. That, that stuff that you're hanging on to, it's bounding up your roots. The kingdom wants to take over your life and bring with it all the joy and the blessing and everything that goes along with it. But if you're holding on to that stuff, that fear, that, that lust, what, whatever it is that's, that's there, that's, you, I gotta have that or else. The kingdom, the kingdom will be constrained in your life. Jesus had a man approach him. He said, I'm going to follow you, but first, first let me bury my father. Now, it's not like his father was, was laying somewhere waiting to be buried. What it means is my father is, is old. So after he's died, then I'll come and, and follow you. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Here's one of the things we begin to see is that the kingdom is an absolute imperative, must be an absolute imperative in your life. Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. That, that stings, doesn't it? That's why we've got to be careful about this, this hippie Jesus, this mellow Jesus. You know, I don't care whatever you do. You read Jesus and he's like, come on, let's get with it. Let's get with the program. So many of us are just flirting with the kingdom of God. 
We're going on a few dates here and there. But we don't want to marry it. We don't want to give ourselves fully over to it. And Jesus is saying, if, 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 you, if you want to know the life that is truly life, if you really want to be about the business of the Father, the kingdom must become an imperative in your life. So many times we try to work kingdom stuff in as just like you know, a little slice of a pie. I got, I got my work, I got my family, I got my recreation, I got my, my sleep time here, and oh, here, between this time and this time, there's, there's my God time. Instead, we need to see, if we're thinking of it as a pie, the kingdom must be the entire pie. And you're serving up the pie to these different places in your life. You're saying, you know, I'm on a team, I'm going to bring the kingdom with me into the team. I'm, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to bring the kingdom with me and how I live in the kingdom at work. I'm going to bring it home with my family and how I live with my family. That's going to be kingdom-based. Everything is going to be about the kingdom. And I'm going to let it change me from the inside out. It cannot be just a little side thing cannot be an hour on Sunday morning with just maybe a, you know, a couple other hours sprinkled in here and there. It must be the desire of our heart to do the things of God. Well, this can be very hard. And this is why we have this. We have a man who comes to Jesus. We, we visited this last week, but let's revisit it again. A man by the name of of Nicodemus comes to see Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus said, Still missing it, aren't you? Still not getting it. Here's what he's telling him. There has to be a reset. The, the reason Nicodemus was, was struggling to understand the things of God is because he was still trying to bring it into his old system, his old way of thinking. And so we've looked through this message this morning, we see that it requires starting all over, as if it is a new birth, as if we come to it now as children seeing the kingdom for the first time. You just cannot take the kingdom and add it on to your life. You have got to lay it everything down. Jesus said that the kingdom of God was like, like a man who, who he, he was out in the field and he, he found a, a treasure buried out there. And so what does he do? He goes and sells everything he has so he can buy that field and then have what's in that field. What's holding you back? What fear, what other love, what thing is keeping you from fully living out a kingdom life in you? Because we all do. Even to this day, I have, to, I have to stop and go, okay, what is it that my heart is after? What is it that my brain still wants that is not in line with the kingdom? And only when I surrender myself over to it, only when I say, your will be done in this earth, only in that moment can I find the peace that I really want. 
And all of this happens, not because any of us earned it. All of this only can happen because Jesus came for us. His death on the cross was about the kingdom. He came to bring us this kingdom. And we remember that whenever we take that little piece of bread and we take that little little tiny cup of juice, we remember his body and his blood. We remember that we have been purchased, brought out from one place and brought to another to be brought into the kingdom. Question for us, obviously, are we going to go into this kingdom kicking and screaming and clawing our way back out? I don't want it. Or we would say, yes. Yes, I want to live in this kingdom. Yes, I want to know the peace that passes all understanding. Yes, I want to know a joy that only the kingdom can bring. This morning when you take when you take that communion here in just a moment, ask God to show you what's, where you're still fighting, what you're still afraid of losing, what you've put your hope in rather than him. And then ask him, say, Lord, I want to, I believe I need to lay this down, help me in my unbelief. And if you want to come up after that time of communion and use these steps as a prayer place, or you want to just where you're at, however you want to do it, just say, God, it's yours. It's yours. I may be back again next Sunday doing the same thing, God, but I want to, I want to give this. I want, to, I want to follow through. I want to let you have all of me. I want the kingdom working its way through all of me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment we have right now. This moment to remember through the bread and through the cup. To remember Jesus and the kingdom that he wants to be at work in my life. At work in all of our lives. Lord, as we take these simple little elements, help us to see where our hope is misplaced. What fears need to be cast out by love? What truth we need to take in through grace? Meet us in this moment, Father, through your spirit and lead each of us forward into the life of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen.